This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading is by Michael Sirwa, michael.sirwa.sirois dot com. Penguin Island by Anatole France. Book Four, Modern Times, Trinco. Book Four, Chapter Two, Trinco. The sovereign nation had taken possession of the lands of the nobility and clergy to sell them at a low price to the middle classes and the peasants. The middle classes and the peasants thought that the revolution was a good thing for acquiring lands and a bad one for retaining them. The legislators of the republic made terrible laws for the defense of property and decreed death to any one who should propose a division of wealth. But that did not avail the republic. The peasants who had become proprietors bethought themselves that, though it had made them rich, the republic had nevertheless caused a disturbance to wealth, and they desired a system more respectful of private property and more capable of assuring the permanence of the new institutions. They had not long to wait. The republic, like Agrippina, bore her destroyer in her bosom. Having great wars to carry on, it created military forces, and these were destined both to save it and to destroy it. Its legislators thought they could restrain their generals by the fear of punishment, but if they sometimes cut off the heads of unlucky soldiers, they could not do the same to the fortunate soldiers who obtained over it the advantages of having saved its existence. In the enthusiasm of victory, the renovated penguins delivered themselves up to a dragon more terrible than that of their fables, who, like a stork amongst frogs, devoured them for fourteen years with his insatiable beak. Half a century after the reign of the new dragon, a young Maharaja of Malay called Jambi, desirous like the Scythian Anacarsis of instructing himself by travel, visited Penguinia and wrote an interesting account of his travels. I transcribe the first page of his account. Account of the Travels of Young Jambi in Penguinia After a voyage of ninety days, I landed at the vast and deserted port of the penguins, and travelled over untilled fields to their ruined capital. Surrounded by ramparts and full of barracks and arsenals, it had a martial though desolate appearance. Feeble and crippled men wandered proudly through the streets, wearing old uniforms and carrying rusty weapons. "'What do you want?' I was rudely asked at the gate of the city by a soldier whose moustaches pointed to the skies. Sir, I answered, I come as an inquirer to visit this island. It is not an island, replied the soldier. What? I exclaimed. Penguin Island is not an island? No, sir, it is an insula. It was formerly called an island, but for a century it has been decreed that it shall bear the name of insula. It is the only insula in the whole universe. Have you a passport? Here it is. Go and get it signed at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. A lame guide who conducted me came to a pause in a vast square. The insula, said he, has given birth, as you know, to Trinco, the greatest genius of the universe, whose statue you see before you. That obelisk standing to your right commemorates Trinco's birth. The column that rises to your left has Trinco crowned with a diadem upon its summit. You see here the triumphal arch dedicated to the glory of Trinco and his family. What extraordinary feat has Trinco performed? I asked. War. That is nothing extraordinary. We Malayans make war constantly. That may be, but Trinco is the greatest warrior of all countries and all times. There has never existed a greater conqueror than he. As you anchored in our port, you saw to the east a volcanic island called Ampelophoria shaped like a cone, and of small size, but renowned for its wines, and to the west a larger island, which rises to the sky a long range of sharp teeth. For this reason it is called the Dog's Jaws. It is rich in copper mines. We possessed both before Trinco's reign, and they were the boundaries of our empire. Trinco extended the penguin dominion over the archipelago of the turquoises and the green continent, subdued the gloomy porpoises, and planted his flag amid the icebergs of the Pole and on the burning sands of the African deserts. He raised troops in all the countries he conquered, and when his armies marched past in the wake of our own light infantry, 
our island grenadiers, our hussars, our dragoons, our artillery, and our engineers, there were to be seen yellow soldiers looking in their blue armor like crayfish standing on their tails, red men with parrots' plumes, uh, tattooed with solar and phallic emblems, and with quivers of poisoned arrows resounding on their backs, naked blacks armed only with their teeth and nails, pygmies riding on cranes, gorillas carrying trunks of trees and led by an old ape, who wore upon his hairy breast the cross of the Legion of Honor, and all those troops, led to Trinco's banner by the most ardent patriotism, flew on from victory to victory, and in thirty years of war Trinco conquered half the known world. What? cried I. You possess half of the world? Trinco conquered it for us, and Trinco lost it to us. As great in his defeats as in his victories, he surrendered all that he had conquered. He even allowed those two islands we possessed before his time, Ampeliphoria and the Dog's Jaws, to be taken from us. He left Penguinia impoverished and depopulated. The flower of the insula perished in his wars. At the time of his fall there were left in our country none but the hunchbacks and cripples from whom we are descended. But he gave us glory. He made you pay dearly for it. Glory never costs too much, replied my guide. End of Book 4 Chapter 2